Hello, I'm Mark Butcher, and it's just over a month since the uh, George Floyd killing by the police on camera in Minnesota, sparking worldwide protest and international conversation about race and equality. Racism is a societal issue, and whilst it's absolutely right to vilify and exclude individuals and groups for overt displays at sporting events, it's much more difficult to draw attention to, let alone deal with inherent biases and prejudice that have existed for centuries. Cricket in the UK can rightly point to a proudly diverse World Cup winning men's team. However, the number of black players has fallen by 75% in the last 25 years and there are no black head coaches or decision makers. Cricket, like society, must do better and the conversation needs to continue if there is to be significant change. In the spirit of continuing that conversation, uh, I'm pleased to be joined by former England all-rounder Philip De Freitas, former Gloucestershire captain and coach Mark Elaine, broadcaster, current director of women's cricket at Surrey County Cricket Club. It was the men's game I was talking about when it came to uh, no decision makers, uh, mm -hmm. Ebony Rainford-Brent, and uh, Raj Tolsiani, author of Diversity and Inclusion for Leaders and CEO of Green Park. Um, George Floyd, his killing, his murder, how did that make you feel as, uh, as people of colour? Well, I, mean, I think, you know, sort of racism is a disease that will take a long time to cure. George Floyd is tragic. The thing is, it's great to see lots of young people of all colours, you know, wanting the, that change. And then, but if you think back to Rodney King, what did his death really change? It didn't really change much, but it's something to work to and something, you know, not every day, all day, but just not when something happens like this. Uh, and that's the way I look at it, really. I have to say, like, when I watched the video, I mean, I, it, it hit me quite hard. I, you know, burst into tears just in the sense of another one, another one. And it then, and I can see why the protests happened. It kind of like popped a valve because it was so obvious what was happening. The fact that it ended up taking the whole world to protest just to get the guys arrested. Um, it kind of popped a valve for me. I feel like uh, we know racism has existed to exist in a lot of the environments. You kind of pretend you don't see things or don't say anything. I think it was one of those where you just get to that point of enough is enough. I know a lot of people have said that expression. That's what it did for me. I ended up, I've been at three protests. I've been quite active. I'm doing fundraisers around it. I just, that felt like for me, it summed up my, a lot of my journey and my personal experiences, experiences for friends and family. Um, and to see it on that level of scale and still have to be answering these questions, I just felt like it was a point of enough is enough. We have to take action now. Otherwise, a bit like you said around Rodney King, you could almost say going back to the civil rights movement, um, when you see things like that, you think, how far have we actually come? Yes, there have been some, some changes which have improved, but are we still suffering from the same disease? And the answer is at the moment we are. I mean, when I saw it, I it, unashamedly, you know, thought, this doesn't look unfamiliar, which is uh, sad in itself, uh, I guess. Um, I saw a, a policeman doing his job very badly, um, but it was more on reflection that it really sunk in, you know, what was really happening and things that happen day in, day out, um, particularly in America, but um, I'm sure it's a reflection of maybe what's happening in society, uh, as we stressed earlier. And um, it was really sad. And, and I think that the words that he echoed as well uh, really resonated with a lot of people. Stephen Lawrence is, an, is another, I mean, something a little bit closer to home. You know, we've seen, we have seen um, incidences where the entire country has been moved to, uh, to, to make a stand. Um, and yet, here we are again, some 30 odd years later, with, with, with similar similar outpourings, the, the conversation needs to continue. That's the important thing. Uh, Raj, your, your feelings on the incident itself and, and kind of how, how, do we, how do we turn the anger and the outpouring um, of, of disgust about this into something that actually moves things on in a, in a, in a, in a way that, that is palpable? Well, well, I think disgust is, a, is the right word, isn't it? Disgust and, and, and fear and what we've seen, um, both in America and also in the UK, and I do sit on the Met Police Stride Advisory Board, is that there's a real disparity in how black people are treated. And you know, BAME is a phrase that we use, but not everybody's 
um, uh, experiences are the same, particularly when we get onto cricket. There's a big disparity there, isn't there? But I think we, we, what we might be seeing now is an opportunity to say having a conversation is not enough anymore. You know, wanting to do the right things is not enough anymore. And we want to co-create and guide some of that action because actually the feeling within the community um, is hot. And it's not something I think that is going to um, cool down very quickly because it's just too familiar. You know, the death in custody is in this country as well. They're just not videotaped. The interesting part is for, for, from my point of view, I guess, um, and one of the one of the things that perhaps people, you know, white people from the UK may not understand or, or may not see in all of this is that if you if you can put your knee on on a, on a man's neck and keep it there for eight and a half minutes, I don't know if you've tried to kneel for eight and eight and three quarter minutes. It's pretty pretty tough, pretty difficult. Do that knowing that you're on camera. Do that while a man sort of pleads for his life. It kind of says, it says to everybody of, of colour, it kind of don't matter. We can do this. This can be done to you, your life with impunity. And it has nothing to do with George Floyd as an individual. It's his, you know, whatever his crimes, whatever they may have been, are totally and utterly irrelevant to the, to the action that was taken. And, and, I, and I wonder whether or not that was the thing that kind of, um, that, that has resonated so roundly with, with, uh, with, with black people and, and um, people of colour in this country um, and why perhaps it is, it, is, it is stuck around with everybody for, for, for what well, it's over a month now and we continue to talk about it, we continue to need to talk about it. I think it's that feeling it could be any one of us, isn't it? Right. You know, I think it's that feeling that um, we're not just second class citizens but we're at risk despite all of the things that we're told around equality, it doesn't run through in our experience. So that's why I think it is, I mean, it's such a shocking event, but as, um, as we've said before, it's not an isolated event, is it? I think also from the, the UK perspective, you know, I know you mentioned Stephen Lawrence, there's Mark Duggan, there was a lot of issues with that case. Actually, there's a good film which shows you uh, sort of since the 70s, there's been a thousand people have died in police custody and the stories are coming out. Um, and I know for me, it resonated because it's really interesting. When I speak to my white friends about things like stop and search, it's not an experience that any of them have. All the friends I grew up with, good people, constantly stopped and searched by police, constantly having their rights violated. I've been in cars where they've raided the car um, to find nothing because there was nothing to find and getting completely embarrassed and humiliated. And I think actually there's a lot of experience. You look at the, the rates, for example, um, you know, black people are 10.5 times more likely to get arrested for something like armed robbery. Um, 10.5, like, and I was trying to explain to friends like, this police brutality and things that, like that happen in the US, there are issues here. Your child and my child could be stood right next to each other and grow up. And just because of the color of their skin, these sort of things are gonna happen significantly more. Um, and it goes deeper. And that's where I think sport comes in. It goes deeper. It goes into the opportunities in society. It goes into the, the invisible doors that are actually put up. You put in a CV with your name and it shows any ethnicity. You and you're a lot significantly less likely to even get interviewed. Um, so I, I think that's why it resonated because, you know, you watch it and you think, this guy knows the situation. I'm sure you've seen the videos of the lady Karen, who, who I don't know if you've heard of it, but a lady who abuses it and causes the, calls the police, um, using the word, I've got an African-American, just because she knows what will happen. If a policeman gets turned up and, and, and knows what happens in society, they'll take advantage. So I think there are a lot of issues that came out, but I think it, it really sparked everybody's emotions around how sad the situation is and how much we haven't done anything to break that down. Yeah, so I mean, it, it's it's lived experience, isn't it, for uh, for for all of us? Um, let, let's let's move the conversation onto some something a little bit more specific to uh, to cricket. I mentioned in the opening that, that the numbers of, um, uh, of black of Caribbean um, extraction players uh, in the professional game, the men's game anyway, has, has gone down by some seventy five percent. I think there are only nine players, nine black players in in county cricket um, in 2019 and only two I think out of 118 coaches and support staff um, throughout the professional game are of colour. 
when you think back to sort of the the, the days of, of of my I suppose watching the watching the game as a kid and thinking about the likes of Viv Richards and Joel Garner and Malcolm Marshall, the representatives from the Great West Indian sides who were an absolute fixture in, in county cricket through the 80s. And then, of course, you know, people like Wilf Slack and Roland Butcher and, um, you know, the representative guys who went on to play for England. There, there were a lot of black players. I mean, the Caribbean was highly represented in, uh, in the professional game. Um, that does not seem to be the case anymore. Uh, can, can, we, can we point at any particular or any reasons um, but why that might be so and what can be done to, to turn it around? Well, I mean, I can, I can only talk from my experience really as a youngster. Um, I went to Wilsdon High School, uh, which is a state school, and uh, Chris Lewis and myself both, you know, both went to that school. And if it wasn't for inspirational, you know, sort of school games teacher, um, I wouldn't have had a career. I mean, he took time and, and, and that's, that's the difference. He took time, he saw us, he saw us as two you know, black kids. Um, we've got no kit, we've got, you know, nothing. And he supported us, helped us, um, and then eventually we ended up playing club cricket and then moved on from there. I, at the moment, you know, this is where I'm very passionate about it. I see too many kids from state schools, they have no help, you know, with cricket at all. Um, and the, the most important thing also, cricket is a very, very expensive sport. It is very expensive. And a lot of the, you know, the state schools, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not talking just about that, the colours as well. It's different colours, the kids. Some of them can't afford it. And, I, and I, you know, and recently, in you know, this lockdown, I'd imagine you'd have, you know, and I, and I did a, a little stats on it, you know, because I'm involved with London Schools Cricket Association. And I did a stat and I, and I asked a question and I said to them, how many of you have done one-to-ones in the, you know, the last three weeks when we've been allowed? And, you know, they all... You know, sort of majority of them have turned around and says, yeah, we've done um, at least two one-to-ones, you know, a week. How are the state school kids going to, you know, sort of compare to that? How, you know, how, how are they going to, you know, sort of be able to, you know, keep up with, you know, sort of the private school sector? Uh, and unfortunately, and that's what's happening. I mean, that, that has been a, that's been a major change, hasn't there? So, you know, late 80s, 90s, where... But playing fields were sold off. It was policy, basically, that to, to, to make it more difficult for, um, for, for kids in state schools to have the facilities to enjoy sports of any kind, not just cricket. Um, and and there is a, there's a legacy to that, isn't there? I mean, what, what other examples um, can we think of? So uh, cricket disappearing from schools is a, is a problem. Um, how about generationally? You know, you move, the further away you move from the, the, wind, the wind rush generation, does that become um, an issue where... Uh, the, the parents of, uh, of, of kids don't have cricket as being their sort of first love anymore. Is that part of it as well? I'm just going to uh, jump in from just my person. I kind of, first of all, relate to you, Phil, in terms of one specific person was the only reason why I stayed and they supported everything you need. So when you look at how our game is set up, and I've brought this up over the years um, with powers that be, um, that currently our system is not engineered within those communities to allow any sort of transition. You might have an odd street session or an odd, odd. Uh, community session, but actually if you wanted someone to progress through your pathway, there need to be a bit like there is in football, lots of grassroots programs, talent ID, um, which leads into development courses, pathways into your existing performance structures. And at the moment, there is there is no connection and i've brought this up in the past and words i've heard are around the the terms in uh you know that's more charity or it's social good and it's you know it's seen as something that is not a priority for anybody uh, i think it will become now because of what the conversations are but i think historically it's you know i've even heard stuff like we're not on that level of multicultural thinking now to me what does that say that says the game is not thinking about really building pathways in for diverse groups. And the point you made as well about sort of um, one-to-ones is, let's face it, we all know the sport. If you are not, if you're com comparing a, a private school kid who's gonna have their EPP of performance training going on, their one-to-ones, their club session, they could be easily getting in 48 hours of cricket a week. You compare that to a very talented kid who may have picked up in a street session, maybe going to an informal club that's not well supported, they might have the talent, but unless they are progressing their skill, they're not gonna make that leap and there's no system to, to link that up. And I think if I'm honest with you, I, I wonder if that's been 
semi-conscious or intentional that it's not part of our plan in the past. I think it will become, and I think it's improving. We've seen the South Asian strategy, for example. Yeah. Um, I think we'll see some movement. But for me, it's the structures haven't been built and without building them and without investing, it ends up only being the one or two lucky two who have a really significant individual, individual that goes above and beyond. Mark, you, you represent the, the sort of the private school sector. Um, yeah. Director of sport at, at, is it assistant director of sport at Marvel? Yeah, assistant, yeah, not, not quite the top poncho. It's a, not almost, we're getting there. <laughs> um, you know, so, so there's a, you would understand it from the, from the, from the public school point of view. Um, Raj, on the other hand, um, as well as uh, as well as being CEO of Green Park and author, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Club cricket was is is your background, isn't it? Um, and you and you had and you had issues um, with the it was Pearly Cricket Club, wasn't he? Sort of <laughs> growing up down there um, and making your way in that background. How, how important are clubs in the absence of schools being able to kind of provide? Uh, provide sort of like the grounding for, for, for the game of cricket? How important are clubs and, and how, how good a job are they doing? From a personal perspective, I think we've come a long way from, you know, somebody in the dressing room saying, well, we bought an extra bar of soap for you this week or, you know, when we're playing Caribbean Commonwealth saying you're in the wrong dressing room. You know, we have in many ways moved forward from that type of racism. What we face now is more institutional prejudice and that can only be dealt with on a systematic mechanism um, to answer your question directly you know I think when you look at any system as we do with all different types of organizations you look at leadership you look at administration you look at grassroots so not having black coaches or not having coaches whose lived experience is relevant to the communities that we're trying to engage with takes any heat out of the system so forget about how much bias there may be further up in the system. At that grassroots yes. level, clubs have an extremely important mm -hmm. part to play and they are not being held accountable, whether it's on women's cricket, whether it's reaching out into local communities. And I've been at Dulwich now for the best part of 20 years as a club and it's okay. You know, it's a club that does well, blah, blah, blah. But we're less than a mile and a half away from Brixton and our black playing staff is reduced. You know, we run seven teams on a Saturday, so it's a big club by modern standards. So there is definitely this piece around move away from rhetoric and let's part putting in systematic accountability for clubs, counties, administrators and leaders of the game to all be singing off the same hymn sheet. Early lockdown, I was doing a piece for Black History Month and I was asked the question, do you, um, what do you say to kids that see cricket as a white middle class sport? And I had to pause for a bit. And, uh, you know, bear in mind, I was born in Tottenham, uh, went to Barbados when I was four years old, grew up in the Caribbean when cricket was at its pomp. I loved cricket then, that's when I fell in love with cricket. And everyone in the Caribbean at the time saw black cricketers as the cream of cricket. So I never grew up ever thinking white, you know, cricket was for white people or, you know, opportunities were just for, for white people. So I didn't really understand what he was saying. Um, of course, uh, in England, uh, a lot of the, the cricket now is played in independent schools. And if there is any kind of black talent or talent in the state schools, they're soon kind of sucked in by way of scholarship um, to these schools. So it, it kind of drains those schools of, of any talent anyway. Um, and I could see why people would think, you know, cricket is for, for white middle class. And I feel particularly responsible because I know two of the real key factors when I was quite young, I was lucky to have John Shepherd as coach at Gloucestershire when I got my first contract. I never aligned it really to, to, to colour, but hopefully, you know, maybe that's where I got my opportunity, I don't know. But also, very early in my career, the day after I got my first 100 for Gloucestershire, we played Somerset, and Viv Richards was in the Somerset side. As I was walking out to bat, he said to me, well played the other day. And I was like, if you could imagine a young lad who grew up in Barbados, got Viv Richards on a pedestal here and everyone else is way below and um, it meant so much to me 
But there'll be black cricketers now that will not get that reassurance from people like that um, in the game. And for that, I feel partly responsible and I need to get back in the game and start influencing these guys to keep playing this beautiful game. I think that you, you're, um, when you played for England or when you, when you started playing for England, um, you had the likes of Gladstone Small around. Um, you, you weren't on your own. Chris Lewis, of course, that you mentioned that you, come, you came up with. Um, how, how was that for you back then? I mean, you know, Roland Butcher was the first, wasn't he? 1980, <laughs> um, You weren't far, far behind him. Well, yeah. were, you, were you welcomed in, into the dressing room? Were you welcomed as a, as a black player in the country? In my household, my family, my, my you know, my mum and dad, the family supported. You know, West Indies was such a powerful side back then. They represented, the, you know, the, 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 the black person basically, and that encouraged me to play cricket. And then I had my heroes, your Bofans, your Lambs, and so on. Now, school cricket, you know, I never got the opportunity to go on trials uh, for Mill Six Colts. Every time I went on trials, the excuse was, uh, "Sorry, you go this side." I'm from the wrong school, and it, you know, it was you know it, it was a bit of a colour issue really. I was always pushed aside, so I never never represented Mill Six Colts, and I felt I was good enough to. Um, then you turn professional, you know, and then I got the opportunity to turn professional. The one thing I would say, I always felt that I had to be twice as good as you know, the white person. You know, and which is quite sad, and I felt that way. And that feeling where you felt you were just on your own all the time, you know, you, you felt that, you know, people used to say, you know, why don't you get involved? Why don't you, you know, be more, you know, with a team? And it was that feeling, you just felt, you felt lonely, you felt all on your own, you know, and it was tough. It was really tough. Um, playing for England, to have Gladstone Small, to have Chris Lewis was fantastic, you know, you know, it made you feel a bit better. But you never felt secured. You never felt secured. You never felt, I never felt welcome. You know, I always felt that every game was my last game. But the one thing I would say, you know, I was desperate to play for England. First ball. First ball for Phil Simmons. And more important for England, it's first ball for Philip De Freitas. I mean, I can go through some experiences, you know, I've had, uh, which people don't know. I mean, I received hate letters from the National Front. You know, wow. and it's not it's not only once. I received that that two, three times saying, if you play for England, we will shoot you. You know, I had police looking after my house. I had a sponsored car with my name on it. I had to remove that, the plane car. So can you imagine me driving down to London? And with, I remember the next game was at Lord's. I drove down to London. I'm in that hotel two days before a test match. And I'm thinking, do I play or don't I? Am I going to have a sniper? Can you imagine how I feel? How can I focus on playing, playing uh, cricket for England with all that? But my determination, I would not allow those people to beat me at that. But the, the problem I find, I had no support. I had no help. I couldn't go to anyone. You know, I had to deal with that all on my own. At times I went home, you know, I'm getting quite passionate about it because, it, you know, you, you go back and it, you know, and it hurts quite a lot. And I remember going home to my mum and I said, Mum, I don't belong there. I don't feel like I belong there. And it, you know, and it's, it, you know, it was really tough. It was tough, go, you know, growing up and playing. And you know, but I, I'm proud of what I've achieved. I'm proud that I've actually, you know, had a career and played, you know, played cricket for England. Hmm. It's well, quite interesting that um, Daffy, because we, we spent a lot of time together, played in a lot of teams together, and believe it, we've never had this dialogue. No. Uh, he's saying things there that I'm, I'm not even aware of. So yeah, this, um, when we're talking about let's move forward and, and get this going, you know, we, we, we've got to start communicating with each other and, and get, get it out there. Yeah, I, it's interesting. I, I was watching a, a, a show last night, actually, um, the school that tried to end racism. And the premise behind it was <clears throat> a woman came in from, from the States, something they trialed over there, <clears throat> And they, and they split the class in two. They basically identified anybody that was either black or Asian or had a mixture of, uh, a mixture of the two. And they stayed in one classroom and, and the white kids, the, the white English UK kids went, went to another. And the conversations that they had would blow your mind because just as Daffy's just 
illustrated there. The black kids, the colored kids, were all emboldened to be able to, to give, to, to, to live their experiences, to, to share with one another um, their experiences of, of what, it, what it has been like for them um, in a way that they wouldn't have done when the white kids were around <clears throat> for, fear of, for fear of upsetting them, really. Not for, not for fear of, 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 uh, of, of, being, of being called names, but for fear of, of sort of upsetting their sensibilities. And the white kids in the other, in the other classroom were, were unbelievably upset about being separated, didn't understand what being separated was like or what it felt like, um, and, and did not know how to have a conversation about what it meant to them to be white because they'd never thought about it before. So, you know, the, the very fact that Daffy felt able to, to sit there and share that, that story, those stories about his, um, about his early days is exactly what keeping this conversation going means um, because, you know, there's an educational side to this as far as I see it, not only for, not only for, for, for white folk, if you like, but also for, also for us um, in order to be able to, to, to speak and let people understand what it feels like because people don't know. So just, just, just to jump in there, Mark, I mean, for example, I mean, I was, you know, there was a big article in the Wisdom magazine, this isn't my prime playing for England, and it was massive, it says, you know, interlopers, you know, call me an interloper, you know, and, and I thought, you know, I'm, I'm trying my best to play for England and I've been, I've been labelled, I've been called an interloper by the Wisdom Cricket magazine, which was out there in the public. And do you know what really hurt the most? I had no support, no support at all, you know, and all I had, and, and this, is, this is what still eats at me, all I had was trying to solve it quietly, you know, and I, and I refused and I said, I, I'm going to take you to court because I want you to publicly apologize to me, you know? And, you know, they, they gave me a settlement or whatever, and that went to charity, you know? But that wasn't, that was, it, I wasn't after that. I wanted support from other, you know, other people, you know? And do you know what, what concerns me now is I look around and, and I, you know, we talk about the, you know, the head coaches, how, how many are there around? You know, why is this still going on? Why are we still, you know, th these things are still happening? Mark, you coached, you were head coach at Gloucester, won a couple of trophies too. Um, have you tried to get back into it again? Have you, have you sent CVs off? What's, what's the story with you there? So, right. So, uh, I, I kind of, by default, ended up coaching Gloucestershire. At the time, I wasn't quite ready. I, I think we had appointed Graham Ford and he pulled out at the last minute. I was still playing at the time. So, I agreed because um, I, I was kind of doing a, a master's at the time. And... Uh, you know, my lecturer thought, you know, strategy and, and all this would be quite a good thing to do practically. So I, I agreed and also she asked me to, to be head coach while I was still playing. Did it for two years as a player and two years uh, after I retired. And um, yeah, I, I really quite enjoyed it. It wasn't something that I thought I would go into um, straight after cricket. I had uh, other aspirations, but I, I really loved it and I still love it now. Um, after that, I thought I need to be a, a, a better coach. My record was was reasonably good, uh, as you said. Uh, you know, I won a couple of trophies and and, and stuff like that in, in those four years. But I thought I need to be a better coach, so I went to the MCC and thought I'll learn the real hard grind of coaching at academy level, and thought I would be there for maybe two or three years and get back in the first class game, and, and that's where. I kind of got stuck, really. I, I, I tried hard to get back in the first-class game with what I thought was now quite a punchy CV. You know, um, a good playing career, good leadership um, with, um, with my captaincy, experience of coaching at first-class level, experience at coaching at academy level. Now I thought, I'm the full package, I'm ready to go. But, yeah, just couldn't, couldn't get back in, couldn't get an interview. Um, I did the interview for, for the national women's side, and, um, but Mark Robinson got that ahead of me, uh, which is fair enough. Um, you know, he was coaching first class Sussex at the time. So no, no problems there, but I thought I had enough to get back in the first class game. Raj, is, that, is this something that you see, um, you know, throughout your research, that there is, <clears throat> there's representation but at a certain level, but it's very, very difficult 
um, for, for people such as Mark to sort of break through uh, and go higher up to become like Ebony, a decision maker? Yeah, absolutely. So um, firstly, you know, the, the, the four other people on this call you know, have broken ground and you know, there will be thousands of people watching this who will see you as role models. So, you know, it's difficult to hear what you've had to go through. But what we need to focus on is how we stop other people going through that now. And some of the stats that you mentioned about participation in the game are shocking. Um, if you look at this as a talent management or a talent system, you know, you look at how people are selected for roles. So Mark, you know, the selection criteria and feedback that people get for roles and leadership tends to be either delivered by people with that lived experience or people who have inherent, you know, seven parts of the seven types of inherent bias and they don't have training in that. What are the, the, the seven types of inherent bias? Point it, spell it out. Mikey, there's, um, I can't reel them all off now, but you know, you've got things like affinity bias. So because that person is close to where I am or where I think I am, I'm more comfortable with them. You've got lots of biases around risk. So, you know, this chap, the, the chap you mentioned who, who got the job, you know, he may have been on a scoring mechanism better than you for that job. But, you know, you can't look at a system and say, well, over the last hundred jobs, there are no ethnic minorities who would have scored higher. So there's, there's, you know, there's a broad range of reading people can do about that. But the basic principle is that systems are not fair. So unless we change the systems at every level, then we end up with people saying, well, you know, talent is everywhere, but opportunity isn't. But we need to get specific because cricket, because of its hierarchy, actually has a, the best chance of becoming the most inclusive sport in the UK quickest. But action needs to be taken. And that action can't have people at the top of the game marking their own homework anymore because it's simply not dripping through to the grassroots level. And then in the middle, you've got administrators with no idea around diversity, no idea around inclusion, no assessment in terms of their current capability, no scoring mechanisms to hold them accountable to each other. So if you look at that in a business or an institutional context, you just say it's like playing darts in the dark at the moment. <laughs> Emily, I saw you nodding away furiously there. Oh yeah, so much of that resonates. Um, and I don't know if it's all right to talk about the ACE programming. So we um, at Surrey launched a project called the ACE uh, program stands for African Caribbean Engagement Program only in January. So we we realized if you look at our demographic, for example, in Lambeth, 42 percent. So nearly half of the kids are black Caribbean or mixed um, black African or Caribbean heritage. So if you sum that up into numbers, 33,000 kids are walking past our gate every single day. And that number is growing and we are seeing absolutely zero transition. So um, there's a number of conversations. I spoke to our chief exec, spoke to Lonsdale Skinner, who's a former Surrey player, one of the early uh, stalwarts as such, and just said, we need to do something. So one thing I think is really interesting, and I think this is a myth that I hear through the cricket world way too often, that is a reason for non-action, which is black kids are not interested. They've all gone to football, no one cares. That is the nar narrative. Uh, whenever I've pushed, tried to push agendas in the past, we marketed it. We got involved with Sky, BBC, Telegraph, all that sort of stuff. We went to the black newspapers. Our phones were ringing mm -hmm. constantly for a month. Parents, church leaders, community groups. We had a hundred kids walk through the door for the trials. Um, we were only offering, we decided to offer a talent scholarship. We were only offering 16 places. We had to pretty much double it because there was talent that was such a level that could walk, you know, almost ready to walk straight into our performance pathway. Mm. When we did some um, sort of stats around the background, half of the kids didn't have a cricket club. So not affiliated to any club at all. When we did look at the clubs that some of them did have, they are clubs getting zero support from the system. So straight away, we started to kind of dig into this um, and, and, and it kind of built a picture for me, which is one way we run off this myth, which allows us to not take action. They're not interested. Well, the honest truth is there was real interest. Some of these kids came through. I'm not talking athletic talent. I'm talking cricket talent, bowling wheels, smacking the ball, ready to go. So the, the, I started to go, where are they learning? I don't know. We, this is where we need to unpick. Um, so what I would say is, one, we've created a, an academy, which unfortunately, because of COVID, because we could have seen a couple of kids possibly break through the summer. One, 
we just need to get active because we can reignite and reconnect. Um, two, there are a lot of conversations around trust that had to be built. So, you know, if you're in a community, but you don't feel like you're servicing it, I can understand why a lot of people were asking some hard questions. Where have you been? Why has there been no support? Why? And, and those questions have to be asked. We have to rebuild with the community. But what it gave me is a sense of hope. There is talent out there that is currently playing um, and enthused by the game. And I didn't even know that existed. And we didn't know that. It, um, so I think we've got a bit of a model. Some other things that we want to link into that and um, is coaches. We had to go out and find, right, we need this environment, this academy to have high level of coaches. We went out and looked for various different um, coaches. And actually, there were some high talented coaches from the black environment that who have level threes and we decided to bring them into the party because this might be a, an opportunity for them to progress up the pathway and get more experience. We want to sort of bring in role models of experienced players, etc. But I think you need a hub as well where coaches know that they can come and get a look in and get a chance to work with high quality players and move up the pathway. And I think that's something that's missed. So what I would say is that has given me hope. If we were having this conversation and we hadn't gone through that ACE experience I think I would have just thought I'm getting out of this game I'm going to go and live on a boat in the middle of the sea or something because it, it seemed so bleak but this experience the response from the community the parents everybody wants it they want that to be reconnected and there's talent that could be in our system if we invest so um so Daffy um and Monty Lynch my, my old teammate at Surrey England international himself are both working together at the London school so you know the, the London schools has brought through you know, the Tudor brothers, for goodness sake. You know, there, there has been talent that has come through that. But you, you London school boy as well, Mark? I, I did play London schools, did. even though my school didn't play cricket. I was quite lucky. Okay, so we've got, so we've got two, two former international players who've both thrown their hat in the ring to that uh, particular organisation. We've got Ebony with, uh, with, with the ACE programme just down the road. Um, you know, there, is, there are things afoot. Um, there, are th there are things taking place. There, there is an issue that it's not countrywide, right? You know, you, you don't have perhaps the uh, the hotbed of, of Caribbean um, interest everywhere in the UK. I mean, Birmingham, there should be no reason why that's not the case. Um, Bristol, there'll be pockets. Manchester. Manchester. So, you know, the, there, there is the spread of that. What, what do we need to do um, in order to encourage, um, you know, more, more people like Daffy, more people like Mark, more people like yourself, Ebbs, to kind of to, to, to lead this because if you if as you say there is Caribbean talent out there what needs to happen who needs to drive this where does it need to come from it's got to come from first of all first of all it's got to come from the top and what I mean by that is I don't know if anyone saw a graphic that Telegraph uh, released around board representation for black people in the UK I think they went through 20 of the major sports and there was like one person in athletics I think that's it um, so first of all, if you've got nobody at the top table, and I know from my experience at Surrey, we were able to have this ACE agenda at the top table conversation, which fed through the organization because there was someone asking those questions. If that is not happening at the ECB level, and it's not happening in the power room, then you're going to see the reflection of less than 1% participation at grassroots, is what, is what we're seeing. So one, it has to happen at the top table to um happen i think they i don't know how they how and where they're going to start recruiting but i think they've got to get that in order um then you need to come down to the levels of the talent pathway is this considered in all the strands you know i sit in conversations around women um grassroots participation the, the new inspired generation all these sort of different strategies that go through is this really woven in to be accountable i think we heard those words earlier from raj about accountability within systems um, and I think the honest answer at the moment is uh, it isn't. That needs to happen. Then secondly, I think programs like ACE are the uh, starting points, but I think there's a lot of work to do reconnecting in the grassroots. We're talking to some big funders, um, which could see it as a model that's built out. It's not hard. I know that sounds silly, but it's really not hard. Look how the women's game's grown because investment was put into it. It's the same in the sense that you take targeted markets, you understand what their needs and you go and service your communities. And I would say, this is the crux of it. Cricket doesn't service the communities. It services the original communities that it was intended for. You think about cricket as a game set up in the empire, private schools, elite, etc. That is what our game's still servicing, unfortunately. And that's what we're seeing as a predominant coming through. It is progressing. 
but now we need to really break that down and get into the, the heart of the game. Raj? Um, I, I agree with much of that in terms of tactical, but mm -hmm. it does nothing to address what I think the principal issue here is, making cricket anti-racist. So, you know, as we've seen with lots of organisations, you can build more representation in the lower ends of your organisation or sport, but unless that proportionally travels through administration and leadership, you end up with a fish with a rotten head and a leaky bucket, so people just don't stick with it. So I think these kind of well-meaning um, programmes um, have an effect, but unless you yes. have the ambition and the investment in systemic change, it's just window dressing. And that window dressing may affect hundreds of lives, but it will not change the game. So, you know, I could put an ethnic minority on every county board in six months, right? But unless they have got a mandate for inclusion, unless there's governance around inclusion, unless there's measurement around inclusion and constant training, um, then really what you're doing is you're not addressing the real issue, which is we're not getting treated the same. And for me, that's a systemic issue that requires a systemic solution. And with Sport England, they simply don't have the appetite. I'm hoping cricket does. So, I mean, we're not talking about, um, you know, you, you South Africa, for example. South Africa uh, pops up for me a lot in these conversations um, around, um, you know, apartheid, uh, the fact that, that English players went off and, and played under the apartheid system and, and have basically most of them have been allowed back in and into the high echelons of the sport, um, that South African players have represented England um, at, a, at a level that is, I don't know, actually, I probably should have looked this up. I apologise, but I'm not sure whether it's, you know, there are 12 um, Caribbean, black Caribbean players who have represented England. There are six who were born in the UK have represented England, two of whom are on this, uh, two of whom are on this panel, Mark and myself. In the men's game, we're talking again. But in terms of South African representation, there's, there's tons of it, right? But we're not talking about, Raj, not, um, sort of positive discrimination, are we? That's not what you're saying. You're, 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 talking about, um, you're talking about something entirely different, or is it not a million miles away from that? Well, I mean, I think people in this country are not ready for quotas, and positive discrimination, you know, most people don't understand what it means. Legally, you can use something called the tipping point, which means the two candidates are equal, and you've got a shortage of one type of candidate, you can appoint them. And that is anywhere. And um, what I'm talking about is not um, filling in the gaps. What I'm talking about is creating or, 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 or saying that the people who are underrepresented need to improve themselves in order to get um, a foot in the higher echelons of the game. What I'm talking about is a more transparent, equal, systemic view of talent management across cricket at grassroots level, in administration and in leadership. And that means it has to be lived experience at all of those levels, but it also means we need to connect the experiences of the past with proper, transparent, available plans for the future that have been co-created with the communities we're trying to engage. Otherwise, we're marking our own homework again, and that's yeah, not gonna make any difference. Yeah, I get what you mean. Mark, you, you mentioned, um, you know, in your sort of impassioned um, speech about uh, your coaching career and, and, and where you hoped it might end up and where and where you are now. Um, it, it sounded to me as though there was a, there was a, a tiny tinge of, of, of self guilt about the fact that you're not in the game being able to help this out. I mean, you know, by the sounds of it, this is not it's not entire it's not your fault. You know, the, the, the guilt shouldn't be there. But what I mean, what do you, what realistically do you want to do? How, where do you want to go? Where where in two or three years time would you like to be? And what would you do if you were in a in a position? created by Raj, for example. Before I answer that, I do agree with Raj because we can't argue that in America, uh, for instance, black representation in sport, there are three major sports, basketball, American football and baseball. The representation is high, but yet they still have this massive problem. So kind of getting black cricketers playing is great for cricket, but it's not really tackling mm. the societal problem. So, um, a lot of work to be done there and um, I'm happy to do whatever I can now. I haven't done enough uh, in the past, 
But yeah, so talking about where I want to be as a coach, uh, I remember when I was at the MCC, I sat down with, with John Stevenson at the time, told him what I would like to do as a coach. In turn, I then had a chat to Gordon Lord, and I had international aspirations. I said, I want to coach internationally, and I know I need to be back in the first class game to give myself a chance. And um, I, I think shelf life at international level is about three to four years. So I was in a great rush to get there quickly. And I want to be the best coach I can be when that opportunity arises. So I wasn't kind of rushing to get there. But yeah, I still hold those aspirations. And the only vehicle to get there is through the first class game. And I haven't ruled that out at this stage. Is that an issue for you, Daffy? Have you, do you, have you had sort of similar thoughts? Have you tried... Um, to, to make your way back into the first class game, or have you just, you know, you've been happy with, with your lot? What, what's been going on for you um, with, with Leicestershire, Lanx, etc.? It first started with uh, Nottinghamshire. I mean, I was uh, part time, I was working at uh, the private school, Oakham School, and part time I was working with Nottinghamshire as a bowling coach. And, and I enjoyed it, I loved it, and I, you know, I was, it was great being, you know, sort of back in, you know, in the first class game. So I did that for three years and then eventually. Um, I think the role became full time and I think Andy Pick got it. So then I moved on and I did a little bit of the same thing with Derbyshire. Uh, and again, someone else came in and did, did the same thing. Now, a few of those jobs, I, have apl I applied for a few of those you know, roles and I just kept getting the same response really. It was just, uh, you lack experience. Um, I'm a level three coach. You lack experience, and I'm thinking, wow, you know, I've, had, I've got so much knowledge, I've got so much experience of the game, and I'm passionate about that, and the game is my life, basically, and I lack, you know, experience. And I kept saying to him, well, how the hell am I supposed to get experience when you don't give me the opportunity to? Um, and it, it felt like that, and it just felt like that. And I think you get to a stage where you think, I can't be bothered anymore, because I'm not getting, any, I'm not getting anywhere with this. Um, and the one thing about me is I'm passionate about helping kids from all background, you know, into the game. Uh, and that's why, basically, I work with London Schools Cricket Association. And, and I feel, you know, there is an opportunity. But the only way, you know, we get, you know, sort of black kids into, into, into cricket and, you know, and start, you know, educating them early is we have to send people like myself who have experienced it, who have been there, to go into that community. I mean, they said, you know, we, we look at London schools, um, for example, and you know, we, we send out letters to, to certain clubs or certain schools, and we get no response. And, and I think the only way we do it is by people like myself going there, talking to them, and getting them out there. But we need support. We need support. We need funding. I've had enough of people talking about, uh, we can do this and that. Actually, put the money where your mouth is, as, as far as I'm concerned. Let's, you know, let's get support. Let's get this going. This has gone on for too long. You know, we've got the people to help out. Let's support it. And, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate at the moment where, like I said, I'm working with London schools, but also I'm helping out with Leicestershire Academy. And I do a bit of scouting as well. I go into, you know, I'm hoping to go into school, go and look at some kids. You know, you're talking about from kids in London, you know, who won't have the opportunity. And if I spot them, then I will try and give them the opportunity. And, and, and I, I enjoy that, Ron. That's, to me, that's what I'm passionate about. Well, you can hear that. That's, uh, that's coming through loud and clear. Um, West Indies are coming over, which puts a smile immediately on everybody's faces. Uh, they've, done, they've done the ECB a huge favour as well in, uh, in putting up with, with quarantine, coming here um, with COVID-19 still in the country and, um, and, and basically digging the ECB out, out of a, a, a massive hole. Um, Phil Simmons has, has been on record saying that, uh, you know, that, that he, in his time playing in the UK, in the, in the leagues, suffered racism, and that the West Indian team will be marking in some way, and I'm sure the England team will as well, knowing what I know about the, a lot of those individuals on that side, will be marking the, the, the Black Lives Matter movement. Is, how important is it that, that your, your national teams, your international teams, the West Indian team, do that in keeping this conversation going? Um, and, and what else would you like to see the, you know, the flagship of the game do in order to, uh, to, to, to really make something happen? I mean, I had an interesting um, 
experience actually, captaining uh, England Lions in the West Indies. Uh, we were playing again in their um, first class competition and uh, against one of, one of the islands, as captain of an England side, I got a bit of stick from the, um, the island guys, you know, about being black and leading a white team and, and all this stuff. Uh, I wasn't particularly offended at the time. However, we had a good dialogue that night after the game. And I, you know, I asked them if they thought they were blacker than me and, and you know, these kind of things. And the next morning, I promised they could knock on the door. These guys were so humble and apologized for their behavior straight away. And I think Daffy mentioned it earlier. Part of the problem is people cannot apologize when they get it wrong. And I was really proud of these guys to think, sit back overnight and think, crikey, that was really misjudged. Got it totally wrong. I'm going to apologize and try and get it right. And that's what people need to do. I think by apologizing, it's like an admission of guilt and no one wants to go there. Um, but unless they do, we're not going to move forward. So they've got to get rid of these barriers, rip them down, apologize and do the right thing. And as we said, get rid of all the, the normal rhetoric, which is trying to pacify everyone and keep them happy. Let's see some action. The Black, the Black Lives Matter movement, yeah. um, you know, it has, it, again, has sort of, has taken hold. Um, it, it took hold, you know, after the last sort of a, a tragedy and atrocity that came about. But it, it seems to have, it seems to have stuck around. The conversation seems to be continuing a little bit more. We've, we've seen, um, you know, the Premiership football players uh, before matches taking a knee um, in, in solidarity. Do, how important is it for, for, for sports people because of their visibility to, 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 keep, to keep going at this? And, you know, how important is it going to be for the West Indies and for England? For, how important is it for Joffre Archer to kind of like to, to stand up and be counted? And, and, and I say that slightly hesitantly because I've, I've had the feeling that Joffre himself has come under fire. Um, you know, with criticism that would only have been levelled at somebody from the Caribbean and not from a counterpart who, who was white in the team. So it's delicate everywhere. I, I think it's really important. I think, one, the visibility and the platform the players have is massive. Uh, sport is the only real level playing field. Once you all get on the park, that's why we love sport around the world and why it has helped historically break down some of these barriers. It is the only level playing field that exists. And I think, in some ways, we're fortunate as a country, England linked to the empire, having the West Indies come over, who are, you know, obviously only gained independence in some of these countries not that long ago from England. So I think there's that history behind it. Um, I think it's powerful and I think if the West Indies make a stand and decide to take a knee but also if England decide to do that I think that sends a massive message we've seen what happened Burnley the other day and you had the, uh, the, the plane going over with All Lives Matter and seeing the captain come out um, I think it's ben, his name's Ben Mee or something like that isn't it but I watched his speech and that to me we talk about anti-racist that speech to me from ben me the captain was anti-racist we do not stand for that this is not how we operate that sends a message to fans it sends a message to all the community that we are in solidarity so i think it's important i, I think if they come together um if they make a decision to do it um and support that i heard jimmy anderson in an interview saying he would consider it he said he never really thought in depth about some of these issues but he would talk with the team and if they felt they needed to he would and, and that says a lot to me that says you know the team is becoming anti-racist not standing for that sort of behavior and that sends a message to the fans in the community on, on Joffre Daffy you're in a similar position to him you know you, you, were, you were born born in, in Dominica you were you know a black player in a, in, a, in, a, in a white team I suppose if you want to be as as crass about it as that um he he now has a spotlight on him for a completely different reason. People are kind of looking to him to take a lead on this. And as I said, I, I felt at times last summer during the ashes and during the, the tours in the winter, that Joffre was kind of coming under the sort of fire that, that I thought had, had long disappeared from, from, uh, from the, the game. So, you know, how, how would you deal with it if you were him? I wish I was able to come out and stand up for what I believed when I played. And the reason why I didn't, because I, always, I was always afraid that if I did, then I'd never play for England again, or I'd be seen as a troublemaker. The guys now have got a great opportunity to, to stand up and be counted and, you know, 
and send the message out because um, because this is going on. This is this is happening, and people are supporting them. I never felt I had that support. I never mm. thought I ne I didn't think I could do it, and I wish I I wish I did. I wish I could have. You know, but back then you felt that if you did, you know, you 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 know, you'd be in trouble. You wouldn't play again. So the guys have got a great opportunity of doing it now, and I hope they do. I support them, and you know, and I hope they do it, you know, and, and for the right reasons as well. Yeah. Well, lady and, and gentlemen, I think we've uh, we've covered quite a quite a large gamut of uh, of the subject, and I and I sincerely hope that the, the conversation keeps being had, and that people in uh, in positions of power are are, are listening um, and taking note, uh, and hopefully that it won't be long before we see. Uh, chief execs and CEOs and people making decisions that, that really affect um, the way that the game is played and the way that, that, that um, you know, funding is, is, is shared out, et cetera, et cetera, in order to, to make the game as inclusive as we hope it is. I go back to the point about England, um, the World Cup winning England team and, and the inclusivity of them led by Owen Morgan. Um, you know, the idea that the players would, would not spray champagne until Mo and Ali had left the scene. You know, that sort of idea that we can be together in the same team, in the same dressing room, respect one another and still represent England. I think that's a very powerful message to take away from this. Um, keep talking and uh, keep remembering that uh, black lives matter. And that doesn't mean that yours don't. Thank you very much to my guests. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the podcast.